So as a producer, are you saying to yourself, fuck, or are you saying, fuck? I was like, fuck, this didn't just happen, did it? I mean, we were like, what the fuck? Yo, what is up, everybody? It's Pete Manzanelli here for Poker Poops, and today I am joined by a truly prestigious guest. He's a poker player, he's a producer for Poker Nights in America, and also a very controversial tweeter. Matty Glances, welcome to the show, my bro. What's up, man? It's good to be here. Yeah, dude, I'm good to have you on. You know, I've been tracking you on the tweeters, I've been tracking you with this Poker Nights in America. You're kind of like a man about town in the poker worlds. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I, I mean, I'm tracking you too. I'm watching your videos and laughing every time. It's uh, it's really good, good thing. I, you're very entertaining, and I like that. I like to support things that are entertaining for poker. Definitely, dude. Why don't you tell people who might not know? Obviously, people know you as a professional poker player, but you're kind of like this man behind the scenes with Poker Nights in America. What do you got going on over there? So, um, I guess my official title is producer for Poker Night in America, which you're, what you're talking about. But overall, I work for Rush Street Gaming. Uh, I'm a, a consultant for Rush Street Gaming with everything to do with poker. So we have four casinos, three with poker rooms, one in Pittsburgh, uh, that's Rivers in Pittsburgh, and we have another Rivers in upstate New York where that King of the Hill was just uh, filmed. And then we have Sugar House Casino in Philadelphia, and then we also own Poker Day in America. So it's a, a bunch of good poker properties. Yeah, and let's talk about this King of the Hill. Uh, I have to ask, was this your brainchild? So, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I came up with the idea. Um, you know, kind of formed out of the Kate, Kate Hall, Mike Dentali match that we did back in March at Sugar House. And that kind of was just something that popped up on Twitter with those guys fighting. And I'm just like, you know, why don't you guys play heads up, uh, you know, grudge match on Poker in America. And we worked it out. Um, and then after that, I was like, you know, how are we going to continue this? And, you know, a lot of people said, well, why don't you have grudge matches all the time? But it's it would be kind of hard to find people that hate each other enough that want to play each other at the same time. So, you know, that was kind of like a difficult idea to, to sustain going forward. So I want to come up with something that seem, that's similar but interesting, has drama, um, and, you know, produces, it's an entertainment show first, Poker in America, and Poker second. So that's what we're going for, and, and I think that's what we got with King of the Hill, so it worked out pretty well. Yeah, and did you, did you hand select these participants? Did you put out feelers, or were you kind of like, you're like, I know I got to get Phil Helmuth in there, you're the puppeteer back there, like, how much behind the scenes are you uh, trying to select these personalities? So, okay, so we'll, we'll back up a little bit. So back up in, uh, in January, when yeah, Kate and Mike started fighting on Twitter, and, they, and we were talking about them doing a grudge match, I knew the guy I had to get. I didn't even know him, I never met him, but it was Doug Polk for the commentating of that. And I knew I had to get him because he's really the best at that job and best at, at really entertaining people at poker. So got him for that match back in March. And then when I came up with this idea for King of the Hill, there was two people that I knew we had to get on there. And one was Phil Helmuth, of course, who turned out to be the winner. And then Doug Polk was the second. So I knew once I had those two locked up, it's going to be success no matter, no matter what. Um, then I looked around and, you know, obviously Jungle Man's one of the no known for years and the best heads up online guys in the world and he's and he's played a lot of live poker i played a lot of live poker with him this summer and he's you know he's actually entertaining people don't know that and he he really gave it his best best effort to be entertaining so with doug and with phil so i really appreciate that and he did a great job and then frank casella a guy i know for a long time who's you know a big sport and uh you know he won the world series player of the year so um he's one of the most friendly guys in poker most well-liked guys and i wanted to round it out with kind of like a wild card it's not much of a no limit hold him a uh, heads up player, more of a mixed game player, but I knew he would like, you know, he loves, he loves Dole, uh, Doug and he loves Bill. He loves these guys. So it'd be a good time. So it was a good foursome. Yeah, no, for sure. And let's talk. Yeah, let's go through this. So the very first match, you know, I'm tuning in, we got Casella's and Jungle Man's and it's over in like five minutes. So as a producer, are you saying to yourself, fuck, or are you saying, fuck? I was like, fuck, this didn't just happen, did it? I mean, we were like, what the fuck? How this just happened? And, you know, you can't, it's not like you can blame it on Frank. It's not like he played it, but he just got cooler. He flopped top two on like a King Jack three board and, and Jungle had ace 10 and hit, hit the gut shot and turn for the nuts. And, it, you know, it had to go in. It wasn't like somebody played bad, but it was just like one of those things where you're like, damn, we got, we got to, you know, we got a lucky here. So we got to, we got to figure out something quick. And as you mentioned in one of your videos, we scrambled and it was actually Helmut's idea. It's like, well, 
He's like, why don't a couple of you guys play heads up? You know, why don't why doesn't Doug play Frank or something like that? Doug play Jungle. And Doug and Jungle were like, yeah, let's do it. So we like got them right to the table. Um, they played like a couple of like exhibition 10K heads up matches, just you know, kind of for fun. It's small, it's kind of small for them, but it's entertaining for the people watching on on Twitch and the live stream. So we banged that out. We got a couple of those matches in um, and waited for the big match that night. You know, the big headline match was obviously Helmuth and Polk, uh, the second match of the of the semifinals. No, for sure. Yeah, and before before you guys got the uh, the kind of fun little heads up match to buy time, you threw one of these fantasy guys to the wolves, Josh Norris. You put him out on the felt there. You did fantasy questions for thirty minutes. I was reading the chats, dude. The fantasy people in poker, like I'm, 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 you know, definitely in both worlds. But some of these people were not having the fantasy were, football they, talk. <laughs> so that was a little, you know, we we kind of we did throw him out to the wolves, on, you know, unknowingly because to, to us it seemed like. Most of our viewers are in the same subset as the people that would be into fantasy football, you would think, right? Would poker think. Players. But they were there to see poker, and they were not there to hear about fantasy football, apparently. Yeah. Because this guy, he's one of our biggest sponsors. So um, Roto World was, is one of our new sponsors, and we were trying to promote them. So that's why we had him on an interview. And uh, Todd Anderson, who's the executive producer of Poker in America, interviewed him for like about a half an hour and Josh, and Josh did a great job, but people just didn't, they, they just wanted to see poker. They didn't want to hear about fantasy football at that time. So they were really frying them on the chat. So we learned, we learned from that. We're not, we're probably not going to do that in the future. <laughs> hey, you know what? If, if someone's going to blaze a trail of finding common interest between <laughs> fantasy sports and poker, it's going to be me, Josh Norris. Don't worry. I got your back, bro. Um, <laughs> So let's talk about the thing everybody wants to talk about. Uh, the, the Polk Hel uh, Helmuth match, that was a great match. Um, but everyone wants to talk about the Jungle Man full. Wait, what? So you tell me, what do you think was going on in his head at this moment? Was he just, did he get, you know, trapped by the spell of white magic? Like what happened there? Okay, so live when when I saw it, my reaction was just like Doug when he was announcing was like, you know, what what just happened? Is that even like that can't be possible? And the first thing that came to mind my mind was like, oh shit, the, the, our card readers, the RFID readers, they pick up the cards wrong. You know, maybe he didn't have a ten, maybe he didn't have trips. But then, you know, right after the next uh, the next break, me and Doug went up the jungle and we're like, you know, what was that? And, did you have a ten? He's like, yeah, I had a ten. So he's like, I had ten five. So it was a legit hand. And he, the way he explained it, he's just like, look, you know, Helmut's never bluffing for his tournament life. And, uh, you know, he's bluffing so small on the river. And I don't beat any 10s. He had 10-5 on, a, I think, a 10-10 jack, three deuce board or something like that, where even 10-6 beat him. And the flush got there on the river. So the way Jungle was describing it, it actually made sense. And it's so so rare. I mean, we've, watched, we've all watched uh, thousands of hands of Phil Helmut lifetime. And you, he almost never bluffs. And for to think he's going to bluff – his last 10,000 chips and 50,000 on the river there um, is, you know, is, is pretty odd. So I think from Jungle's mind, even though math wise, it's just a no brainer call. He's thinking, and he thought about it quick. He didn't even take much time. He's like, this is Helmuth. He's not bluffing. He's, you know, I don't beat anything. I really have a bluff catcher at this point. And, uh, you know, he just folded and he just folded him. And, you know, thankfully it was great. It was great for the drama because right after that, Helmuth never looked back and just ran him over and just went from like 5,800 out of 200,000 chips to, to winner. It was amazing. It's crazy, dude. And I guess that's the bonus of like Helmuth has this kind of knit persona, like he's always going to have it. So the one time he doesn't have it and he wants to pull that over, he can he can get away with it. It's pretty sick. I mean, no one. the thing is, no one else in the world would bluff there for the last 10,000 because they, they assume they're just gonna, always going to get called. And no one else in the world is going to fold there for the for that ten thousand. So it was like it just was like a perfect storm. I don't, I don't know how it happened, but it was super lucky for, for for us, for me, for Poker Night in America because we got such a such a great storyline out of it. You want to know how I know you really enjoyed that moment because we have all seen the photos, the stills of you <laughs> smiling, looking longingly at dear Philly Helmuth after this match. Like, thank you for bringing me ratings gold, Mister Positivity. <laughs> Exactly what I was thinking. You know, well, also Phil's a, a great personal friend of mine. So he's a really a guy, and I've known him for years. And he's, you know, outside of poker, he's just a great guy. So, um, you know, I was happy for him. But I was, I would have been just as happy. For, I'm good friends with Frank and 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 Jungle and Duck. So, like, it was like whoever won, it was be great. 
Okay, so let give some give people something here about Phil Helm. You're you're a good friend with. It. I I personally enjoy Phil Helm. Use I would say. Oh, you need to take a break. No. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I saw a pause. Like, be careful what you're about to say. No, I was gonna say. No, I moved up. I was I was getting into it. I because I get these questions a lot. I can only assume. Okay. What you're no. Gonna no, no, no. I, I feel like I have a, a good angle on this. I'm just wondering, I feel like the one criticism of him is it seems like a lot of times he lacks self-awareness. So I would be curious, like in downtimes, not playing poker, not entertaining, is there, does he draw, does he have more self-awareness in his conversations or is it still kind of like Phil all the time, 110% okay. of the time? All right. So the answer is no, he has no self-awareness. And, and I'll give you a great example. So about I think it was January or February this year in the winter. Uh, I flew out to California where me and Phil are going to go out to Thunder Valley. I flew out to his house first, and then we're going to drive to Thunder Valley to play in a poker in America. Uh, so um, I pick him up at his house in Palo Alto. So it's like a probably like a two and a half, three hour ride out to Thunder Valley, if I remember correctly. And he says, Matt, he says, listen, don't, you know, we can't really talk too much during the car because I have to finish a chapter in my book. My new book's coming out this summer in my autobiography. So you really can't talk. Um, you know, I really got to write this book. So you got to do me a favor and just be quiet. And I'm not, I'm not that much of a talker. When, it's all, when we're alone at the two of us, it's, it's always him talking. So right there, you know, obviously he's not self-aware. But of course, the entire car ride, he was talking to me. I, I barely said a word. And he got maybe like five words in, in the book done, that whole three-hour ride. And talk the entire way, and just like a total self lack of self awareness. But that's Phil. And I feel like Phil would do like you know the Michael Jordan thing when he gave his Hall of uh, Hall of Fame speech, and he was instead of just enjoying the moment, he was calling out all the people who had like wronged him over the years. I feel like Phil Helmuth that his Hall of Fame speech would be like, and I wrote this book despite Matty Glance talking my ear off for four sure. hours at a car ride. For sure, that's, I'm sure that's what he's thinking too. So. That's why. No, I've heard of He's talking about this book and he's like, my fingers were about to fall off typing as if he's the first person to ever type more than 500 words at a time. <laughs> no. He, no, but he was good. It was a, it was a very entertaining product. Uh, I think everybody enjoyed it. Had a lot of fun. Is there, is there going to be another something similar coming up? Uh, what's next for kind of poker nights in America other than your regular cash games? So the next stop we have is September 22nd, 23rd and 24th. And that's in LA at Hawaiian Gardens. First time we're ever going there. It's a brand new poker room. They redid it and it looks super nice. And we're going to have a celebrity game, um, a high stakes game, and then a tournament we're filming out there. And the following week after that, we're coming back East to Pittsburgh at Rivers in Pittsburgh for the second King of the Hill. And obviously you know who the reigning king is right now, so he'll be returning. Nice. So it's uh, Phil Harmouth going to be uh, defending his title as King of the Hill versus uh, Olivia Bousquet, who's a great heads-up player. Um, Mickey Kraft, you remember him from the main event? I He's do. the guy that's buying everyone drinks. And having, you know, he was doing a great time. He was having a great time with only a few hundred players left in the main event and really destroying people. Um, and then we have Tonka, who you might know from online, uh, Tonka Pete's, uh, Parker Tolbert is his name, but most people know him as Tonka, who is the, I guess the, the second largest Twitch streamer in poker right now, really, really popular online. So it's going to be a good match, a uh, good foursome over there too. Nice, nice. Well, it, just real quick, you, you did mention a celebrity game and I've, I've been, re do I need to refresh my email again? Or I'm, I'm just wondering, <laughs> or do you do those by like snail mail? Oh, I thought you were on the East Coast, or else I would email it to. Yeah, this yeah. One's no, dude, hit, hit me up, dude. I mean, you either want me on the felt, dude. I can swing down the Sugar House. That's not too far from me. And also, dude, if we want to kick this guy, Jamie Stapleton's out of the booth, whatever his name is, you, you're looking for a true kind of entertainer to come into the booth and spice things up. Like, I'm your guy. I'm your guy. Dude. You might want to figure something out where you could come on board because you'd be great. You would be a great addition, whether at, on the table, behind the scenes, or in the booth. That's what I'd like to say. I'd, okay. I'd say hi, haters, to everyone. There would be the, I love it. the haters how, and losers. How about you and Doug Polk in the booth? That would be a good combo. Dude, me and Dougie Polks, let's do it, dude. Let's do it. The two kings of YouTube right there, dude. I work that out. Um, excellent, dude. So I, I got to ask you. So you, so in addition to all these things, you also somehow seem to find time to be quite the prolific tweeter. How, how do you squeeze this into your busy day, sir? <laughs> I love the Twitter. Everyone knows that. You know, I put a lot of time into it as far as like, you know, uh, just when I when I tweet something, you know, I'm usually looking for reactions. Everyone knows that. I'm really looking to push buttons and, and I have fun with it. It's like to me, 
you know, it might not be fair to other people, but to me, it's Twitter's like a video game. Like I'm just like down there trying to level up and, you know, create havoc and, and, and try to like, you know, like fire guns and stuff, whatever. But like, I'm just having fun with it. I, I think a lot of people take it too seriously, but you know, that's part of the game. That's right, dude. The, the trolls don't know they're being trolled, dude. You just, you just, you know, up the game on them. It's like multiple exactly. levels here. What a, so as a guy who's quick to point out things that bother you or to kind of stoke the flames, the proverbial flames, what is like your biggest pet peeve in the poker industry right now? And it, I guess, it, I know you've been talking about politics and stuff, but let's, let's say poker. Like what is something that just is a real bee flying around in your bonnet? Um, I mean, I don't really have, I'm, I'm a pretty lighthearted guy. I don't really get, get ruffled by that many things. Um, some things that might annoy me are like the, you know, basically the idea of every all the professional poker players in the world coming together and trying to like bury all the bad things in poker and the downside, the gamble, the, you know, the gambling habits and the and the leagues people have and and the scumbags in poker and trying to like keep that quiet so that more people can come in poker and not scare people away. And I, I kind of think that's kind of shitty. Um, and I think the more that is exposed about the game will be better for us in the long run overall because you know the more that it's exposed, things. That's, uh, it makes it easier for things to get better. And as long as you keep, you know, brushing things under the carpet, it's like these things are going to continue, like scamming and cheating and stuff like that. So I like to bring every, everything I, I am personally involved in that I find out is bad. I pretty much put out on social media and make sure people are aware. And I, and I think it would be better for everyone if, if everyone did that. Yeah, and one example of that, you just did this the other day. Apparent, now, tell me, I, I don't know if you've ever fleshed this out other than in those tweets, but... Did you get taken for a large sum of money from a dude that oversold his main event? So um, you're talking about Zell. So like I'm friends with Zell, right? Like I like like not close friends, but I always liked him. He was a nice guy, and uh, you know he did me dirty, but whatever. He 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 had about from what from what I gather about 26 victims, where they're all in a group chat now, um, and I'm they got I'm in the group chat with them, and the, and all these people were staking him or backing him, whatever, and, and found out that he uh, oversold for the main event somewhere between 150 and 250 percent. And then I don't know how he just managed to cash in the main event after overselling, which makes no sense to me or anyone else. But I don't know what the end game was there. But, uh, you know, I think he's starting to make payments to people now, um, from what I heard. So, you know, hopefully he'll make things right. And I, and I think down deep, you know, he's a good guy and he – doesn't want to screw people over but you know from experience i know i've dealt with a lot of poker players where they're very honest until they get desperate and when money gets bad or they're desperate for other reasons you know they, they turn around and, and do bad things and i think it, in all of life not just in poker when people are desperate they're, they're less uh they're, they're less likely to do the right thing in in desperate times so i feel bad for them i feel bad for all these for all these guys in these situations so but, but so what now do you think it was it was a you know a concerted angle he took as opposed to just being dumb at math? No, no, no. He, he wasn't. It wasn't a mistake. He knew what he was doing. But I think it was because he was so desperate with money and, and desperate trying to you know pay people back. And it's sort of like a Ponzi scheme where he's kind of taking new people's money to pay old people back and trying to get new investors. Um, and you know it was definitely a hundred percent wrong, a hundred percent scummy, whatever. Um, but it's like he's you know he's a typical poker player that would never do those kind of stuff if he wasn't desperate yeah. and once you're desperate people start doing bad things yeah that's crazy dude i mean i was out there at the world series of poker dude i was playing i was having a good time i can't imagine playing poker while trying to do the math of all the people that like he he cashed what for like forty thousand. you know everybody's celebrating like what is going on through his head he's like oh shit how am i gonna do this yeah i mean my he my piece um i think i only gave him like five or ten thousand dollars, and maybe he owes me about that much now. Um, nothing more than ten thousand, so it wasn't like a huge piece. But there was a couple guys that had bigger pieces, and um, I'm sure the money is more meaningful to them, uh, you know. And it's, it sucks for everyone because I think everyone really liked him. Personally, uh, I never really heard many bad things about him, and a lot he had a lot of close friends in this, you know. The BCP group, the Big Cock Poker Group, you know, all those guys, all his friends, like they uh, they were broken hearted over this. I talked to a bunch of them. All right, Zo, dude, you got to get back on the straight and narrow, dude. If, uh, you know, got to clear this name. But uh, other than that experience with the World Series, what what were your thoughts on your, your World Series of poker experience on the whole? I assume you were out there for, for much of it. 
Uh, I know you were out there on Twitter. So I experienced some of it, dude. The bathroom lines were ridiculous. I had to piss in a shoe. I mean, what what were your takes on this 2017 World Series of Poker? So it sucked. So like, I I wound up not playing many events because it sucked. Like, I come there out there in Vegas. Like, that's the one time of the year I can play, you know, concerted amount of tournaments. And I like to play all the 10Ks and the 50K and and kind of battle it out with people that I'm familiar with uh, that I play with every year. But right off the bat this year, I saw how bad the cards or the playing cards were disgraced. They weren't even up to industry standards. And, uh, you know, it was it, – it's a put, create a situation where uh, having great eyesight, real laser-sharp eyesight, it gives you a big advantage in the game and the tournaments over other people in the World Series because of the situation with the cards. So uh, I chose not to play there much, and I wound up playing the Blas and the Ario all summer playing big cash games, which – Fortunately, it just worked out really good because it was a great summer, mostly probably because of cryptocurrencies, but the games were amazing. Um, and, you know, if I would have known going into the world, going into the summer, I wouldn't have played any of the World Series because the, the cash games were so good. But I, I anticipated on playing a lot of tournaments and less cash games going in, but then just because of the cards and, you know, some of the other lack of customer appreciation situations, like you're talking about the bathrooms, it just wasn't, it just wasn't that alluring to me. So I just... Mostly stayed over at the uh, Bellagio Nari. Yeah. So oh, wait, real quick. You said why? Do, so why does cryptocurrencies make the games better? You're saying there's like rich businessmen that have crypto that are turning it into poker chips and then dumping it off to you? No, that is not the, the reason. The re, but it's close. Not rich businessmen, but but rich poker players that normally don't play as big are now playing bigger because of this cryptocurrency. So a lot of these poker players that were break even poker players or or worse losing players are now have a lot of money. From this cryptocurrency it's great it's been really really good for the the high stakes environment nice dude so like you were saying the problem all these poker players that were too afraid to speak out because they were worried about the you know not getting more fish to come into the game they became the fish with all their own cryptocurrencies they just played themselves it's true there's just some there's players there this summer that i haven't seen those stakes before that really made the game really made the games good so I, even though I've never really owned any cryptocurrency, um, I'm really rooting for it. I think it's great. Indirectly, it's great for me. It's great for poker. So what big picture does World Series of Poker need to do for next year to toss a better event other than fixing those damn urinals at the Rio and, you know, maybe ponying up for some decent cards? Is there anything else that they can do to get this situation straightened out so people like yourself can have a nice leisurely summer battling it out in the 50Ks? Yeah, they just need to have a players panel. So they need to have a players committee or players panel where, where you know, five to eight players that are respected by all of us get in there and they have the time to work with uh, the, the tournament director there and the, and the property and, and try to get things fixed because things like the cards, the playing cards could have easily been fixed if there's a players, uh, players committee or players panel that sees those cards a month before the World Series so they have time to replace them. Like those things should never happen. But when, you're, when it's run by... Um, executives or, or tournament directors without the help of players like the direct and immediate help of po actual poker players things like that are tend to happen so it, i think that would that would really help the situation if they had a players panel and is and is anyone listening to you because you're being very vocal out here has anyone hit you up being like all right dude you're you're, you're speaking some truths let's get you in let's talk let's fix this um i think that it's the opposite so i think you know, Jack Ethel and Ty Stewart, who run the World Series, are kind of sick of me at this point. Um, you know, and we've been, I used to talk to them years ago, five, six years ago. They were more receptive, but as it got further on and saw the same problems over and over again, you know, this is like the third time in five or six years where the cards were an issue at the World Series of Poker. I mean, they're, they're the ones that say it's the gold standard, and this is supposed to be the premier, you know, poker tournament of the year every year in the, in the world. And to have issues with the actual playing cards, it's not like, you know, I'm not one to like complain about the price of the hot dogs, okay? Or, you know, even even if the long lines of the cage or whatever, you know, those things happen. I understand that. I'm an operator too. You know, this, nobody realizes how hard it is to deal with the cage. And I know Jack and Ty, it's it's not their department. It's, it's miserable to have, to have to deal with the cage and to get shit on by poker players all the time. And this is, but this is not the price of hot dogs. This is, this is the actual fundamental uh, I don't even know what to call it, but the playing cards are so fundamental to the game that you just can't mess those up. You can't mess the chips up, can't mess the playing cards up, and you, and you have to have dealers that are confident, which which they have done a great, a pretty good job of. I got to give them credit when the dealers. 
But to mess up the cards three times in the last five or six years, it's just unacceptable. But also between you and me, dude, they need to get figured out. The hot dogs do because All American Dave's has a monopoly out there. They're trying to push their healthy propaganda on everybody, and us bros just want to eat dollar fifty hot dogs like we're at Wrigley Field. Sick, huh? But <laughs> I see. I look at it differently than, than most guys. Like you know, I think they should make as much money as they want to. This is America. It's capitalism, and they got people locked in. If they put on a group, good product, they should be able to charge ten dollars for a hot dog. So I'm not even complaining about that. But I see other people's points that they shouldn't be doing that. Shouldn't be gouging. But uh, you know, that's just business. So I'm not. I'm not worried about that kind of stuff. I'll tell you one thing about my experience at the Rio this summer. I was down in the gym every day before I was playing, real empty in the gym. Believe it or not, the World Series of Poker, not too many guys at the gym. They're too worried about the hot dog prices to work out. And the, at the Rio? Yeah, the, the Rio gym, empty. I think, I. you know what? I picture in my head, I don't know if it's right, but I picture most of the, the players that are successful that, that have time for the gym or actually um, hit it hard in the gym are either renting houses together and being at different gyms outside of the Rio or staying at Aria, Bellagio, Caesars, nicer properties and getting those gyms. Oh, dude, are you did I, are you saying that I just owned myself? I just played myself a pro? I think, so. I, think, I think that's why you didn't see many of those guys in there because I think most of the flat slubs are probably playing or staying at Rio. Okay. I mean, I've stayed at Rio with my time sometimes myself, so I understand. I, you know, I, well played, but I first, just to explain myself, I was staying at the penthouse in the oh, Rio. Nice, so uh, nice. hopefully you've seen my video, staying at the penthouse. Anyways, check that out on YouTube. Um, all right, I have a question for you. Some some current poker uh, events that have really piqued my interest, some very controversial things. You know this character, Leon Sukernix here? I, I don't know him. I know who he is, but I've never played with him. Okay, so the question is, fun-loving, gregarious European casino owner or calculated cheater? Hard to say. So uh, a couple of the high stakes regulars told me that they, that they could prove to me in five minutes that he cheated during the uh, 300K, um, the one where Bonomo and those guys sat out. Uh, they wouldn't show their cards to the cameras. Yeah, the and, super uh, high roller ball. Right. So they're, they are convinced that this guy is a stone cheater, but I, I don't know firsthand. Um, but I kind of lean towards believing those guys. I don't think they would make that up. They know how serious of an accusation that is. Um, and obviously that guy has uh, some issues with loans or, or borrowing money and not paying back. And one guy's suing him, that's suing him. So, uh, yeah, he seems like, he seems like a bad guy, but I, I, know, I don't know him personally. So I'll, I can only go by what people are telling me. Yeah, dude. No, yeah. And there was that other dude, I think Elton saying he was playing late night poker games, playing yeah. on credit. And then because he, you know, Leon's didn't like the parameters of the game, decided, no, I don't have to pay you back. It didn't really count. We were just playing goldfish with grandma. It'll be interesting to see which one of these guys or which, how many of these guys go out to his casino for the World Series of Poker Europe. And yeah. it's, another, it's another thing. World Series of Poker has not done a good job of partnering up with the right people. And now they're partnering up with this guy. And he's, you know, he's a big, it seems like it's a big, big embarrassment. But they're tied into this World Series of Poker Europe. And who knows who's going to go out there and trust his, the integrity of his game out there. A lot of integrity issues with uh, the, the decisions made by the World Series of Poker. Do you think after I called him out on this program, I need to worry about his henchmen coming to my mansion and, and beating my door down? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, but I, I wouldn't mess with the guy, that's for sure. All right, dude, I'm not afraid of you, Elk. Let's do it, Sucre Nix. You and me, dude, mano y mano. Um, we'll play on credit, and then I'll stiff you, all right? We'll, we'll reverse the tables. Um, all right, I have another question for you here. Angle shooting or Donald Trump? Which is a bigger threat to the republic right now? <laughs> so Donald Trump, for sure. So, you know, I tried to like Donald Trump for so long because I really hated Hillary. I wanted and I wanted to vote for Donald. I wound up voting for Hillary um, just because he just did too many things wrong. But and I wanted I wanted somebody in there to blow up the system, which I really I mean, he has done a decent job of that. Uh, it was just someone outside the mainstream that would that would come in there and and kind of get the lobbyists out of the way and kind of mainstream the, the government. But he hasn't really done a good job of that. Um, and he just He's so like self-absorbed and so, you know, I want to like him, but he, every time there's an issue, like a, you know, whatever, a hurricane or or somebody's dropping a bomb, it's all about him. He's like gets on TV and starts saying like, you know, the economy's great. Look what I'm doing. You know, thank you, thank you, thank you. It, it's everything's about him. And he can't make any decisions without thinking of himself, which is like a, a big problem for a president. So I want I want a rational guy that's not 
part of the part of the establishment. Um, so, if, you know, someone like Donald Trump that's rational, that would be nice in the future. Yeah. How do you think Donald Trump will be at the poker tables? Uh, he'd be terrible because he can't even admit his own mistakes. You know, if, you, if you're a poker player, a professional poker player, you can't admit your own mistakes and get better. I mean, that's just the that's just the worst. Dude, I just found the perfect poker comp for Donald Trump's. He's a mixture of Phil Helmuth's narcissism and Leon, Leon Sukernick's dirty <laughs> escapade. Dude, mash those two up. You might have one there. There it is, dude. There it Got is. It. But uh, yeah, so he's. It's it's a shame. It's a shame that we have him as president, um, but he is what what we have right now. So we gotta like coddle him and try to do our best to get through the four years, and, unless some unless they're gonna get rid of him somehow. But I don't see that happening. So, for, you know, I, I'm a liberal, but people don't know that because they think from Twitter. Like I'm always harping on other liberals because most of my friends are just always telling people how to think, what to do, and I hate that shit. And I think it really does us a disservice. So I think. That's a lot of the reason that, that Trump got voted in is because so many liberals were like in your face, like you have to believe this or you're a scumbag or you have to do this or you're a racist. You have to believe in this or, you know, you're, you're third of the world. And, and that just pushed people away to vote for Trump. Um, and, it's an, and we really got to get away from that. So because I, I rail on the, on the liberals on Twitter, they think I'm conservative, which I'm not. But I. I don't even deal with the conservative people because to me the conservative people in general are less intelligent um, in, in general. So, you know, I don't even try to try to think what they're doing the way they're thinking. All right. All, All right. right. I got another question for you. Um, of course, I've always, uh, for the past few months, I've launched a search for my dear friend, Tommy Dwans. And I want to know, I, I ask everybody I know in the poker world if they have any leads, any tips. Obviously, he just popped up on Poker After Darks. Uh, but do you know anything about his current situation? I, I, I feel like he owes a lot of people a lot of money in that he's putting on a facade right now to make it seem like things are okay. Are okay. What is your take? So, I, so you know, publicly he's got a raw deal because he did it. He, I mean, what he did was crazy with the, with the jungle man bet and, and kind of leaving town and not finishing it. But, it, you know, it didn't really get public until recently. But, you know, he's been paying – uh, jungle some fines over over the last like couple of years, two or three years. So I think he's paid him a total of seven hundred thousand dollars in fines that they agreed upon. They were fair so that they would continue the match eventually, but they haven't done it yet. So you know, to me, it's like if, it's if he just left and never finished the match, it's kind of a scam. But the fact that he's willing to pay that much money in fines, which is a real significant portion of the entire bet, I mean, he's doing the right thing, and and that should be you know to his to. Fair to him, to be fair to him, that should be publicized. No, I agree. But what if he has the money to pay, like you said, to pay off those penalties, and he has money to go sit down in games like Poker After Dark, sitting at the Bellagio, playing with Dan Bilzerians the other night? Why doesn't he just have the money to either you know buy it out outright or finish the challenge? So uh, I don't know if it's a money issue. I think it's more of a just like I don't feel like doing it right now kind of issue. And that's the way like he is. And Jungle's the same way. Like they're not. Uh, you know, they're extremely intelligent, both those guys, but they're not your normal average thinkers, uh, not huge on common sense, either of those guys. Um, you know, I mean, just, just to give you an example of how, how much of an alien jungle is, and I like jungle a lot. He left the hotel after being at the hotel the other day. Um, he, packed his, he packed his stuff. He, he got in a suitcase. He left the hotel. This is coming from the front desk to tell me that he left the hotel with the suitcase, but he left all the clothes on his bed. He forgot so the, the pack. Yes. Yeah, she's like, what do you want? Me? She said, what do you want me to do? I saw him leave with the suitcase, but his clothes are still all in his room. And that's just jungle. Typical jungle. I don't even know if he knows. Are you sure he's still not on tilt from that fold? <laughs> he's just <laughs> like, you know, so, he just wanted, he wanted to give those a New York hotel Viking funeral, just leave them all on the bed and move on with fresh clothes to move on from that experience. I mean, he was super tilted after that. I mean, who wouldn't be? I mean, not only did he make that fold, but he went on losing the match. So, you know, he didn't have to lose the match after making that fold. He still still had like a two to one chip lead or something. Okay. So that's super tilting. And I don't want to harp on this too much, but in your personal conversations with Jungle Man, did he bring up Dwan's at all? Yeah, we talked about a dinner. Like we went out to dinner a couple of times uh, in New York with me, Doug, Phil, and Jungle, and, and Sean. And we it, the subject came up a couple of times. And 
you know, when he brings it up, he talks about the the fines that John, that Delon's paying him. So when he talks about that kind of money, it seems fair to me. It seems like they agreed to work out something that in the meantime, while they're not getting together to play the match, he's paying them fines. All right, yeah, I know that it sounds good. It sounds like everything's, you know, above board. I still think there's something going on under the surface, more big time with Dwan's well-being. I'll continue to kind of dig on that, but it's good to know that things are at least appear okay. But just know my man's spidey senses are still tingling here with the Dwan situation. Um, all right, we'll leave you with one more question here. I'll let you get on your ways. Here we go. This is now this just really you're gonna have to really think about this. Is continually asking if something is good for poker, good for poker? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't like that. I don't like that whole subject either. It's kind of annoying by now. It's like whatever. Let's 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 just be entertaining. Uh, try to try to make things fun for poker and uh, leave it at that. And nothing has to be. Nothing really is good or bad for poker that that often. You know, big scandals are kind of bad for poker, but other than that, there's nothing that's so great for poker um you know talk about like the new things in poker are like uh king of the hill or flopomania or whatever poker stars is doing their new thing like none of these things are like good for poker they're just whatever like hopefully something sticks and something works and and, and things work out so let's all just try to as poker professional poker players we should all try to be more entertaining um you know i always looked at myself as an entertainer at the table not just a poker player and it served me well, and I think that if, if we all did that together, it would just help the game for sure. Yeah, dude, not the brags, but the brags, dude. I was playing in the 3K at the World Series of Poker the entire table, uh, the entire day. I was at the same table for like six hours. We were playing show at once. We got everyone to agree at the table. We were drinking beers. We we're having a great time. You know, we, we can bring entertainments to the table. We just got to get all these nits to come out of their shells, pull their headphones out, take the sunglasses off, except me. I am an exception. And just have some fun at the table, right? We need more people like you, man. So you're great for the game. It's so funny. And I love your videos, and I think it's going to only grow as people see them. And I'll keep retweeting your stuff and make sure it gets out there. Nice, dude. Well, I really appreciate you yeah. taking the time uh, to come on. You know, I'll keep refreshing my emails for those celebrity games. And uh, is there anything else? Obviously, follow you uh, on Twitter, at Matt Glance. You got all the cool stuff going on with Poker Nights in America. Is there anything else you'd like to plug? Nope. Just happy to be here. Happy to talk to you and finally meet you. And uh, you keep doing the good stuff, man. Sounds good, dude. All right. Well, for Pete Manzanelli, for PokerTube, get paid. Get laid. Later.